Welcome to today's discussion on the Federalist Papers and Anti-Federalist Papers, sponsored by the Principles of Freedom Foundation. The purpose of this foundation is to provide a platform for discussing the ideas pertaining to freedom, just as was done in the town squares, churches, and taverns during the founding era of this nation. Ideally, those who listen to or participate in this discussion will have come prepared by having read the materials to be discussed today. Participating in today's, in today's discussion are David Bishop, Brooklyn McClure, Julie Farnbach, Tiffany Mason, and Derek Harris, and me, Leah Hone. We hope you will continue to participate in the discussion of freedom even beyond this podcast by commenting on our Facebook group, YouTube channel, and most importantly, having dialogue with your own family and neighbors. So... Um, this week, what we will be discussing and um, what we will hopefully have had the, the time to read is the Federalist Papers, um, number 15, number 9, number 10, and number 14, and the Anti-Federalist Papers is the Federal Farmer 1 and 2. To, so to start out, is there anything specific that, um, that really stuck out to anyone that they um, felt strongly about? I see a little smirk from Julie. I think she has something to say. <laughs> I, I finished up um, today and felt that it was really ironic given what's happening in our capital today uh, that we are talking about um, the theory of factions. And I, I, that's where most of my thoughts uh, have centered after reading this week's reading. Uh, I have a couple of specific things to share when you're ready, but. Um, yeah. So Julie, real quick, for people mm -hmm. who listen later, why don't you explain what today is and what's going on in the Capitol? Oh, okay. Today is January 20th, 2021. And um, Mr. Biden was sworn in as our 46th president. Is that right? 46th? Um, and and uh, there have been some interesting, the, the campaign, uh, the election season, um, not to mention the last four or five years have been really um, very, very fractious, very hot and cold, very either or, very uh, stuck in a two party system, which uh, President George Washington, of course, warned us against. Um, and which uh, Alexander Hamilton goes on and on and on about. And I found that very interesting. I didn't uh, anticipate where he'd be on this, on this side of, an arg of that argument. Um, that, that's it for now, but it so was ironic I, today. I, I, I thought some of the same things about, um, about factions and I thought, found that was really, really interesting. A couple of the statements about factions that I kind of like had written down was the, um, referred to as the diseases of factions and um, that factions are inherent in human nature. Um, so, I, I mean, when it comes to factions, I thought exactly what I thought about, okay, what factions have developed. I mean, obviously like our two party system. Uh, are there any other factions that you kind of like see that we um as diseases for our nation other than the two parties absolutely and okay. and we see that false dichotomy which is a logical fallacy uh we see it everywhere we have vaxxers and and anti-vaxxers and pro-life and pro-choice and and i i try to always be thoughtful and listen to both sides before I decide where I am, where I find truth. Uh, and people, the pressure, even by my trusted associates and friends and family over the last six months, the pressure to come out of, away from one's, the a moderate thoughtful position and side with one of the two extremes, I, I, I think we've all been feeling pressure like that. And uh, it's, not, it's not an accurate reflection of the complexities of human nature to be that polarized. 
the devil is in the details, right? Didn't Shakespeare, Shakespeare say that? Um, that's really true. We can still have true principles uh, and be peaceful and moderate and compassionate and listen to people and, and let them feel heard and, and uh, reach them one-on-one -on -one to discuss important things. And that uh, finesse and that willingness to wait and consider and listen to other people's feelings and opinions seems uh, seems not to be even respected now by the people on the extremes. There was um, a, there was you know a lot about about the republics in general, republics in history and um, and the republic form of government. And I was wondering if um, if our human nature, I guess, um, to break into factions and because obviously at that time they didn't have a two party system. Do you guys think that having those two factions have harmed our ability to have a republic? Since we obviously don't have a true republic nowadays. I mean, it's not not at all. I think how the um, what we have now is not what the founders had envisioned. So, do you think that our, us breaking into those factions has harmed our, our republic and our the initial um, vision that the founders had? So, Leo, maybe I'll interject without completely answering that question. Some one thing that I've noticed this week and perhaps not just this week, is that we've tended to divide up based on what we fear these, what, what do we fear the most? And, and from when we talk about human nature, I'm, I'm finding a lot, learning a lot about um, slavery. We, we have our own lack of freedoms comes often in what we crave and in what we fear. And as we look honestly at that, you, you kind of find these groups fighting vociferously for what they, you know, what do they fear the most? And, um, and and then arguing that because that's that's what you feel you know and and so I just make that that comment and just trying to watch that in myself what am I afraid of and and I find that can block true uh, real, truly receiving and, and understanding um, so I just interject that before answering your your question I perhaps I think I think that's really profound I think that um, we are a fear driven society and I think also about how the um, the attempts for um, our different um, uh, different different positions in leadership of having like an independent party or any other party really have failed so much. But especially, I think like the independent party, maybe more people would want to be, I think, independent. But we keep falling back. As I, I've heard a lot of people say, like I I don't really exactly agree with this party or that party, but I feel like I have to choose a side. You know, I mean, do you think that that affects like our freedom of 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 living without fear or like are we, are we robbing ourselves by falling into this like fear of of being independent i guess like do we have to is it human nature to have to have a side i don't know and how does that affect like how our freedoms have been have been um i don't know, I, I don't know if this exactly addresses that question but what i had you know you talked about how it how does it affect the republic i i thought it was interesting how madison and in Federalist 10 says that liberty is to faction what error is to fire. And so in, in addressing factions, he says, you either, you have to do what, you have to do away with their cause or their effects. And to do, do away with the cause of faction because it's so inherent in the natural species of man, you would have to always have a dictator removing any sort of freedom because you will just naturally turn into to factions right and so our only other recourse is to deal with the effects of it so i think in a and i think that's what we're here to discuss and um i think that's what we're saying i just thought that was an interesting way to put it that i hadn't never thought about before how it is unavoidable you know, liberty is to faction what air is to fire. You you need them both. The fire will go out without the air, you know. Um, a very quick aside, as a prospective law student, I've already started stu studying. And in, in a brief, you all always tackle an issue to look at the facts of the case, the legal issue at hand, the analysis of what law applies and then the conclusion of 
all of what all of that distills down to. It's a formal method of analysis of any topic. And that came rushing back to me as I finished reading last night because I got frustrated reading Federalist and Anti-Federalist and going back and forth. I actually had, uh, I felt like I was back on the school board and I, I had done my homework and I knew the issues on this side and now I was getting yelled at by passionate people who will care about important things who didn't understand what was being presented and so um, made passionate, emotional and some logical uh, uh, complaints against the proposed action. And I felt that same frustration again. And all I wanted to do was stop in the middle and identify one issue at a time, look at it logically and apply what the rational solutions were. And that's exactly what the Federalist Papers are trying to do, but with way too many words, <laughs> right? I wanted, I'd hoped to come in here and be underlining constantly little gems of truth and they are in there, but there's a whole lot of superfluid, superfluity, superfluous language too. Um, but what Federal Farmer said, oh no, that's the wrong one, sorry. Um, what Madison said in 10, um, basically explains to me that because of human nature, we will always end up in court. So that's why we needed the Bill of Rights. So let me explain that um, directly. When there is a question that two people cannot, un cannot grapple with or come to agreement on independently outside of a courtroom, what do they do? They come to court where somebody who has a thorough knowledge of all of the context of the situation can slow down, look at it word by word, fact by fact, and apply the logical solution. And so I felt like with the Bill of Rights, of course I agree in theory with Madison, we shouldn't need it. That was, a, uh, that was, um, it was not necessary in their minds because they were so closely tied to what their natural rights were. But even in their time, they were going to have situations arise in the daily course of life where individuals, good people on both sides would have disagreements and would have to have somebody sit down and work through the, the logic, the justice and the, and the morality of that situation. And as long as people remain to be uh, free, we are going to continue to come up with new, more complex, more detailed, more never before situations that will need to be arbitrated. And that's why the Bill of Rights was inevitable. That's why the, you know, we know from the history that that's the only reason that many of the anti-federalists were willing to sign on and support the constitution is because they'd been, they were promised they'd get the Bill of Rights immediately after. And I see that as we have infinite uh, human nature in, in variety and in a large population, there will always continue to be new things that need to say, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about okay. this? Uh, I agree with a lot of that, but it goes back to my to what David said earlier about, um, about f being free and, and, and fear, fear driven. And so, I mean, you, I think you said something really significant and important that the founders were really close to, we had a close understanding of their, of their, of natural law, right? And um, what their natural rights were. But as we as a people are maybe more fear driven, which as David was saying, kind of drive us further from freedom, but then we have these complex needs, you know, and so what people interpret as a right is not maybe a natural right. So is that necessary? Because you said that it never ends. So does it never end as, 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 as our society and our, um, our country just evolves and develops, whether it evolves and develops into something good or bad, do we continue? Do we have that? I mean, where do those natural rights, like where do we start like defining or cutting the line there with natural right. rights versus 
the, this fear driven what I'm saying, like, like, for example, first thing that comes to my mind is healthcare because everyone says that's a human right. That's a right. No, it's not. It's a service, you know? it's a service because it requires someone else right. to give it to you. Right. So that's, you know, you have a right to seek out your own health. You don't have a right to healthcare, but people will argue today that that's a right. And if that should be an amendment, that that should be given as a right. So to me, it's like, you know, does, it does end, you know, because I think our society can't, can't, I guess I, I maybe be trusted. I mean, it's one thing if, if we have gone so far from the, from, from the founding that unless we can come back to that and have that understanding, then I, I don't know. It's kind of, it's just scary. I don't know what that solution is, but any thoughts on that? I think just really briefly, and then I'll uh, step back and let others have their turn. Um, I think that more people fear the loss of fairness. I think we our, our trend is toward insisting on fairness. And so they will not accept what used to be settled law or a settled list of natural rights. And so they will continue to demand their day in court, quote unquote, whether it's actually in court or not, uh, because they want proof that it's fair and that they don't need to fear injustice. So you're right, natural law uh, may be finite for our purposes here, uh, but the only place, because they're not getting it in school, not in public schools, the only place that anybody in our society can uh, feel like they're getting heard is in a court of law. And that's because we have failed to keep everybody educated and because we're a hundred years past 1913 and all the balances are off. Yeah, and unfortunately, if you've been in family law at all, you don't feel hurt. <laughs> that's a very broken system. It's very unfortunate, um, at least here in California. Um, Derek, did you, were you in a place where you could um, share your thoughts with us? Yeah, let me try this. Does this sound better? Okay, yeah. I apologize earlier. Thank you. Um, to, to, to Julie's point about what, what fairness is, um, fairness seems to be independent in the mind of each individual too, right? You know, it's like, well, what's fair? And, and how many times is it heard in court where at the end of it, someone's like, well, that's still not fair. You know, you think of uh, something like this controversial as the OJ trials, you know, where some people cried, finally we have justice, and other people cried, there is no justice, right? And they're just using that as an example. Um, back to the factions though, um, even though, and I'm aware of George, George Washington's farewell address, and I was a strong proponent of third party for a long time until I did some more research. And it seems to me that even though the founders didn't really formally have a name for their factions that they broke into, because they were Federalists, we're, we're discussing the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, so there's two camps. And sometimes it's really beneficial to coalesce and have people with the same ideas to articulate it in perhaps a different way to convince somebody from the other side to come over on that particular point or that particular issue. Because um, without a coalition of enough people, then you'll never get elected, you'll never get an issue put forward. And if you think of the two major parties at, 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 at present, the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, um, it, it serves a purpose in the sense that, um, well, for example, in the, in the presidential elections, there's primaries. And so there's a multitude of factions wrestling for, for the top, right? And so it's a matter of who's putting forth their ideas um, and, and uh, in a way that's convincing to the rest of the party. And remember that party platforms are fluid too. They're constantly moving um, before abortion was legal that didn't that wasn't a part of a uh, part of the debate um there are several things that have grown into into the party's climate change and things like that there's people um hostile on both sides and there's people reasonable on both sides but it serves a good purpose where if you go through your mind and think of all the things that are important to you there's and you look over at, at both parties you're going to find a party that's going to be more like you than the other party 
pick that party and move within that party to make those changes because you need a coalition of people that think alike that move your move that agenda forward and if you don't like your party platform move to change it you can do that you just need to be able to form groups like this and make those groups larger and larger and larger until you until you have a voice because without also without parties you don't have a majority whip or a minority whip or you know you don't have a speaker of the house because you don't have a party head that's elected within that party um so there's a lot of benefits and I, this is weird for me saying this because i was I, I i was heavy on having a third party for a long time and i realized derek there's not a lot of conservatives in the in the republican party there's it's probably like what 30 percent at the most and so we need those other people it's kind of like those coalitions that were formed in old uh, that I mentioned before, the, the Mayflower um, had a lot of non-believers that were Dutch and they weren't even English. And the English Puritans found a way to coalesce and agree and came up with a compact that they could all agree on. We have to get used to that idea, I think, if we want to move something forward. Because without the votes, guys, we're not going to win anything. And so we need to compromise. And that's what's so beautiful about these Federalist Papers is because ultimately we know at the end there was a compromise, right? Yeah, those are great points. Um, any other thoughts on that? I had some thoughts going back to the Bill of Rights and also addressing a little bit of what Derek said. Um, that I feel like the basis problem, why, why we would even have to continue listing more and more rights is because there's no law the sense of personal people and of self-governance or other so you end up in this position we're always like no what's mine what's my it's almost a selfish like position and I don't think you could ever create a bill of rights long enough to address that and I I would like to see as opposed to another bill of rights a bill of responsibilities to remind people, okay, this is my responsibility as a citizen and primarily first as a member of my family and my community. Uh, like today we talked about public virtue and private virtue and teaching the constitution to our students. And we drew a tree and I said, public virtue is at the roots. And then the, or, private virtue is at the roots and public virtue is the fruit that comes forth from that. If you have a bunch of people that don't have at their root system, self-governance and responsibility for themselves and then responsibility for their family and responsibility then for the community, you're always gonna have this sickly fruit and suffering tree. And I think that one reason, I could be wrong. This just came to me while Derek was talking though. One reason to break into a two-party system, it's easier. How easy is it for people? Most people don't even um, investigate the issues or the candidates. They just go based on what the party says. It's easy. They're lazy. Americans have become very lazy with their freedom. And That's that also, always leads to bondage. So those are just a couple of thoughts. Listen, that, that's all. That's also human nature is to take the you know the easiest route. You know, so if it's presented that way, then yeah, um, yeah. No, I I I agree. I agree with both of your points on a two party system. Um, speaking because um, in in Federalist Paper Number Ten, then he talks a lot about qualified people, and that's something that like Brooke said that we had discussed today in our um, Key Liberty class with the youth and um, and this quote um, from Samuel Adams that I thought was interesting. It says, but neither the wisest constitution nor the wisest laws will secure the liberty and happiness of a people whose manners are universally corrupt. He therefore is the truest friend to the liberty of his country who tries mo most to promote his, its virtues and who so far as his power and influence extend will not suffer a man to be chosen into any office of power and trust who is not a wise and virtuous man. 
Um, and one thing I like about that is that it, again, it falls back on us. So it's like, therefore like the truest friend to Liberty. So like we have a responsibility that we are choosing, um, to promote our, our country's virtue by choosing virtuous people, wise and virtuous people to be in office, which obviously we've fallen pretty far from, <laughs> but, um, but that's what we need for, you know, for Liberty, like the importance, like sometimes it's not. Um, in, in preparing for that lecture, then I like was reading a lot from um, from the making of America and different things that some of the founders had said, and um, they felt really strongly that it was our responsibility, and that's why I think like a bill of responsibility because we've forgotten we have we have the bill of rights and we've kind of as a people have kind of felt like I have that right, you know, um, but we have forgotten that we have that responsibility. And that it, the, the founders believed that it was the responsibility of those who were um, not necessarily more prosperous, but more like um, educated and who were um, who had certain talents and, and certain people who were kind of like the cream of the crop. It was their responsibility to serve in public office. And it was never meant to be obviously like career politicians, but that we had a responsibility to our country to be to seek out the best of the best to be our leaders. And that's just that's just not, <laughs> that's just not how it is anymore. I would um, add, oh, I, I thought you were done. I'm sorry. No, 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 go ahead. I was going to ask a question. I was going to say, I would, I would add, um, I like what Brooke said about the bill of responsibilities and, and included in those responsibilities would be a list of, of uh, consequences. If you're not living up to your public office, if you're not balancing the budget within, you know, pick a timeline, you know, within the year or with whatever timeline that sounds reasonable, you are no longer fit for office, you're derelict your duty and you're removed from office and there's a gubernatorial election or, or there's an election to, to replace you um, instantly. Um, as well as, I don't know if there's infidelity or whatever else that, that the people find important to, uh, to society because the government is supposed to be an extension of rights that we ourselves have as, as people. So if I have to live a fiscally responsible life and I have to balance my budget, then the government darn well better balance their budget because their budget's my budget and your budget and, and all my neighbor's budgets. And if they can't balance that, they're unfit. That's my two cents. You know, my sense is though that any list right now would be incomplete and lead to more arguments than any solutions at this point. I, I just, it's, it's hard to picture solving problems with more, more words actually. I, I feel like our definition of freedom, what is freedom? I, I feel like um, we, we're like Rome as it started its decline and you start to get holes on your border and you make deals with people to protect you and then you treat them badly and they come in and sack your your capital you know i feel like we're we're a bit like that where freedom it's freedom to have things to have what i want and we we interpret those rights to to be free internally because we're not free internally we're trying to protect our own egos our own image this false thing. And so the problem is that even if we have a right of responsibilities, then we're really quick to point out what others should do. And yet, and, and our senses are all off and we can't even observe where we're not being free. And nor can you say who else is free if you, if you don't understand those principles at all. So I keep going back, well, but what do I do except be free myself and then radiate that freedom to children and families and, and be freedom. And so truly, be, honestly looking at, well, where am I not free? What am I afraid of? What am I craving? What am I grabbing onto an image? I, I, I mean, even at my job, I, you know, am I meeting, am I speaking up? I had a meeting today where, where test results were not what we wanted. And yet there's this tendency to, to say they're better because of what we want, because it makes life easier or whatever reason. And so it's all around us, decisions of freedom. And, uh, and I just don't think it's, I think it's to teach responsibility and through experience. And that's what I love about reading these books, reading and going through history. History was to teach us and to give us experience to enlarge our memories uh, through sacred works, through a variety of things, all these inputs to make us greater knowledge, pure knowledge, which is actually love and light. So it's um, anyway, that's my first reaction is right now, a list even of responsibilities uh, would, would just be a source of more argument and pointing at what you're not doing. 
That's great. I think that that's actually a great place um, to end unless anyone has anything to add to that. But I love that message, David, because I think that we get frustrated a lot. Um, we kind of go round and round about frustrations of how things have changed and how um, how things have gotten so much worse or you know, all these uh, woulda, coulda, shoulda's in our history or something like that. But ultimately all we can do is control ourselves, right? And I love that, um, what you said about just um, living that freedom and kind of sharing that light with others, with your family and friends. And um, and I mean, I, tr I truly believe that. And I, I'm part of things like, I better believe that because I'm telling these kids that all the time, you know, that you can change the world. That's all, all that's a constant thing in every class. I'm always like, you can change the world you as like, it doesn't matter. You might not be, you know, um, on a world stage changing the world, but we as individuals, that's the only place that we can really start um, to seek out these freedoms is by living it ourselves and not um, not getting wrapped up in um, in fear. And um, and in the, maybe like the, the things that we see wrong or immoral, like, you know, um, so we change ourselves. And like what Derek said before is um, get involved and, work to change um, the the things that we that we have control of, work to change within our party and you know, different platforms and stuff like that. But if we don't do that, then then we really have nothing to complain about, right? But if we if we feel like we need to change, you know, if we want any changes in our country and if we want to, it, our country to be a place of freedom, it starts with us. Um, does anyone else have anything to add? I was gonna yeah, add something uh, real quick. Cool. Yeah. Um, I think David hit it spot on right now. I think we have a shift of turning to collectivism, right? Like collectively, if we do this for the better of other people and we're being forced to choose things or not to choose, we're being forced to do things for the better of somebody else. When really we, our country was founded on individualism and we need to get back to that individualism and make these choices because it's what we want to do know what we're forced to do and it's only when we can i mean the, the collectivism takes out the personal accountability oh so and so didn't do this so i got sick or whatever it is and we need to go back and actually control what we can control as individuals that's the only way we keep our freedom the good news is i'm free to be happy and to feel peace right now no matter how bad the world is exactly and that's, that's, that's what we've got to go off of. Well, I think that we have in this group here, at least uh, enough like-mindedness, if that's a word, where we can agree to disagree because there's, I find myself sometimes thinking, well, maybe we need to push this point more this direction than that direction and disagreeing in a way where I would be more than happy to accept, um, a, a decision different than mine if it came from if it came from any one of you especially the way you guys are, have, have discussed it because like Brooke said the danger of the, the uh, one of the dangers of the two parties is to get be a lazy voter to go well my family's this party or my work family or my work you know my 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 social circle is this, and we're finding that people, when they start to do some digging and find out what their party platform actually is, they're like, oh my gosh, I was, my whole life, I was this party, not that party. I was, and so we need to be informed voters. And obviously that seems to be a theme we keep talking about, right? Be informed, be educated, learn new words. Um, the dictionary that Brooke has that, that she pointed out. Um, Anyways, I would be more than happy. I would walk away happy if I disagreed with any one of you um, because you have elaborated on why you believe the way you believe, what the benefit of it is and how that would help me. And if I disagreed, I just have to sh shrug my shoulders and go, you know what, you guys thought it out well, I'm gonna go with you. If, if it's the majority, I will go with the majority. Yeah, well said, Derek, I agree. I think it comes down to personal responsibility. So again, it's our responsibility to, to do our own studying and, and educate ourselves and um, make sure that we are making decisions in, um, in, our, in our voting choices and in our, starting with our towns, we underestimate the importance of, um, of, our, of our local leadership 
um, oftentimes because people get so fixated on the, the big ones like the presidential elections and all that kind of stuff. But the people here, right, right in our communities where we can make an, a biggest impact are the ones that are going to affect our daily lives probably the most. So um, definitely, I think that message for today is to um, have personal responsibility, right? We need to build a responsibility and we can just create that ourselves. Um, Brooke, do we have any closing rituals? <laughs> closing rituals. No, we don't. We just say goodbye till next time. Okay, no sacred closing rituals. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you everyone for your participation as a great discussion. And again, let's keep studying. Encourage others to do so as well. Goodbye.